thank you all so much for joining us today. This is our second in our series, As the Engineers Dine with Kidney Failure. Next slide. Before we get started, I just wanna remind everybody of about a few logistics. We will be able to record today's webinar. And in a couple of days, we'll be able to send out information about how you can access the information that we're sharing in this recording and other resources that we'll discuss today. We are going to have everyone muted so we can reduce some background noise. You will not be able to unmute yourself. And lastly, at the end, we're gonna invite folks to please participate in a question and answer session. So throughout the presentation, if questions arise for you, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A box on your screen at any time during the talk. And we're gonna do our best to get through as many of, these, as many of your questions as possible. Next slide. I am so excited to share with everyone today um, our speaker, Dr. Samantha Gelfin. Dr. Gelfin completed medical school at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and then went on to train in internal medicine at Yale, nephrology at the University of Pennsylvania, and hospice and palliative medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Her current research and clinical practice focus on the palliative care needs of patients with advanced kidney disease, including the option of non-dialytic active medical management of kidney failure. I also want to introduce myself. I'm Susan Wilhoyt. I'm a palliative medicine physician in Denver, Colorado, and one of Compassion and Choice's two national medical directors. Later in our program, you'll meet my colleague and co-national medical director, Dr. Corey Carroll, and our excellent volunteer physician, Dr. Mitz Tomita, a physician in, in California. Thank, thanks to all of you today for participating in today's talk. All right. Dr. Gelfin, thank you so much for being here today. You're muted. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, Dr. Wilhoyt. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, me too. Me too. Thank you. You know, let, can we just start kind of broadly? What do we, where, how can we learn about chronic kidney disease? What does that mean? Absolutely. Um, chronic kidney disease is uh, very common. It essentially means a reduction in the uh, function of our kidneys, which the main two functions our kidneys have in the body are to get rid of our waste products, mostly from the food and the metabolism of our bodies. Um, and secondly, to clear out fluids that we take in from also from food and from drink. Um, so when we have when we say someone has chronic kidney disease, what we mean is that their overall kidneys ability to do that, it has decreased compared to normal. Okay. And is this reversible? It depends. Uh, usually when we call it chronic kidney disease, that mm -hmm. essentially means that it's not reversible, it's permanent mm -hmm. and progressive. Okay. Sometimes kidney function can take blips where it goes down and then it is partially reversible and gets better. Um, yeah. But for the most part, the chronic kidney disease is, is thought to be a gradually progressive permanent illness. Okay. And you mentioned progressive. Are there different stages to kidney disease? Yes. Uh, and it's important actually to talk through them because I think it's really mm -hmm. common for people to hear stages and think mostly about cancer. Yeah. Um, like stage four in chronic kidney disease is not the same as stage four cancer. So sure. um, for the numbers people out there, uh, I, we tend to think of chronic kidney disease or CKD as um, based on the percentage of filtration that the kidneys are still able to do. So the percentage that those kidneys are able to get out the fluid we need to get out in the form of urine and get out the waste products. Um, anything over 60% is actually considered normal. So different from high school algebra, 55% uh, <laughs> is, is a fine kidney function. As we drop below 60% um, is when we start to name stages of kidney disease. Um, 30 to 60% we call um, stage three. And mm -hmm. I would call that mild. Um, it's the kind of kidney disease stage where if you were to stay there your whole life, it's unusual for it to have a major impact on your day-to-day -day quality of life or well-being. Mm -hmm. Below 30%, we have a category that's stage four kidney disease that's between 15 and 30%. And yeah. that's what I think the most um, 
most worries crop up about whether the kidneys are going to get worse and, you know, for lack of a better term, enter kidney failure. And what that essentially means is when they're, they're no longer really able to do their jobs and Mm -hmm. the um, toxins that usually they get out of our body start to build up and make us feel sick. Okay. So around stage four is when doctors and patients have to start considering what to do if things get worse and mm-hmm. also sometimes start treating uh, some of the effects of kidney disease like anemia or low blood mm-hmm. counts or high okay. blood pressure, swelling. Those are all things that start to crop up even more in the in that stage four category. Okay. So it sounds like from for the audience, stage three is like you as you said, a mild. Maybe folks are just starting to have a decrease in their function, but it's really stage four. It sounds like that you start to really notice some of the outcomes of the decrease in kidney function. That's right. And then stage five kidney disease is um, referred to sometimes as end stage kidney disease, uh, where usually below 15% of the kidneys function is not Mm -hmm. enough to keep you feeling well from day to day. Um, And that's when you either need to consider dialysis or a non-dialysis sort of medical management of symptoms. Okay. And I was wondering, I noticed you had some excellent slides. I was hoping you could share those with us so we can kind of um, see things visually, if you don't mind. Sure, I'd be happy to. I do have just a few slides here um, about sort of big picture what... um, What I think of when I think about how to best care for people with advanced kidney disease and how to how to help them make decisions that make sense for them and that are in line with their goals and values rather than just sort of status quo I I don't think it's a one size fits all kind of illness. Um, And So I thought I'd just start out by showing this little picture which you know says for the largest group of people who are starting dialysis, um, which is people over 75 years old, um, where many people operate in something of a false paradigm about what the options are. So I think when someone has chronic kidney failure, it can feel like transplant dialysis or nothing, Grim Reaper giving up um, are the options. And Mm I I would, part of what I hope to share today (laughs) is that I don't think it's quite so rigid as that. I'm informed by my training and experience outside of the US. This is a bar graph that quite simply just shows that, um, you know, the comparison of of the black bars, which is the US compared to the gray bars, which is Canada, and then the white bars, which are Australia and New Zealand. This shows Mm -hmm. the proportion of patients who receive dialysis based on their age. So I'll bring everyone's attention to all the way to the right on the mm-hmm. you know, over 85 years old category. The U.S. puts people who are over 85 on dialysis with much higher rates than yeah. our neighbors in Canada and the doctors and clinicians in Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, that's dramatic. <laughs> it it seems dramatic. like we're really using, using this resource, dialysis, um, in a population that our you know, part, or similar countries are using in a much less frequency. That's right. And so it sort of begs the question, well, what do those countries do for older patients when they yes. develop kidney failure? Uh, and I actually went to Australia to mm-hmm. learn that. Um, I was a bit of a skeptic. I was raised in, as you heard, a very sort of classical internal medicine training. Sure. And I had heard that in Australia, they have found ways to care for especially older people with kidney failure without dialysis. And I, I wow. sort of had to see it to believe it. And sure, the amazing opportunity back in well, 2018 to go down oh. to Sydney. It was amazing. So this is me <laughs> with a, walla, a wallaroo. <laughs> Okay, which is a combination of a kangaroo and a wallaby. Um, I'm a combination of a kidney doctor and a palliative care doctor. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> um, and anyway, when I wasn't petting and feeding the wallaroos, I was rotating mm-hmm. in this hospital, learning how um, to use medications to improve quality of life and reduce the suffering of patients with kidney disease for whom dialysis would be too much of a burden or too much of a quality of life drain. Yeah. Uh, so what I learned there is that that form of care, the non-dialysis option, which is often mm-hmm. called conservative kidney management, mm-hmm. actually has a pretty good survival rate. For patients yeah. who are over 75 who develop kidney failure, 
you know, it's not Grim Reefer. It's actually mm -hmm. that if you are managed actively with medications, mm -hmm. the usual survival is on the order of months to years. Mm -hmm. This graph all, you know, I just show that um, since 2003, groups around the world have been publishing their survival data about patients who choose not to do dialysis. Mm -hmm. And people live a lot longer than you'd think. I think mm -hmm. people in this study lived anywhere from six months to three years, of over wow. three years. Um, so it really goes to show that, uh, you know, your prognosis, if you're a certain age and a certain amount of ill when you develop kidney disease, kidney failure, your prognosis mm -hmm. with and without dialysis is, is not so different. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think this kind of information really equips patients and families to make sure that they know what they're signing up for. Mm -hmm. um, this is an article from February uh, of 2019 in the New York Times that essentially showed in more, more basic terms what my other slide showed, that the U.S. Mm -hmm. is using dialysis a lot more prominently for um, everyone than other countries. You know, this quote, so-called conservative management can ease symptoms without dialysis in some people with kidney disease, mm -hmm. but many of them are never given the choice. Yes. So I've sort of put my life's work to making sure people get the mm -hmm. choice um, and sort of raising awareness so that people can advocate for at least having the choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is one of my last slides. I just show it. It's kind of busy, but the, the basic thing is that I think people need to um, engage with their clinicians about decision-making in a, in a way that doesn't just depend on medical facts, but also mm -hmm. on a patient and family's outlook, preferences, mm -hmm. goals, and values. And mm -hmm. if you use both the medical information and the sort of patient personal information, mm -hmm. then I think you can come to a much more informed decision about what kind of treatment plan to put in place. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I included this consent form from the group in Australia because I think it's such a beautiful, respectful, and thorough way to obtain consent for something as burdensome and, and sometimes challenging as dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the red boxes highlight that, the, you know, when you sign saying yes to dialysis, that you're saying you understand the risks and benefits, including the likely trajectory of my condition, both with and without dialysis. Mm -hmm the anticipated effect of my life and support mm -hmm. that I may need and now or in the future from my family and carers mm -hmm. and the option or role of conservative care as an alternative to dialysis. This mm -hmm. is like a life goal for me that every mm -hmm. form in the U.S. should also use this kind of approach and language. Absolutely. Yes. And I, and I really appreciated the, your use of the word choice. Um, because particularly when we think about chronic kidney disease and as someone's diseases progress, oftentimes in my experiences with patients, they're not given the option. They're just told, oh, it's now time for dialysis as if they've graduated to this next step. And so I think for a lot of folks out there, including other physicians, I think they would be surprised to learn that, hey, there actually is an alternative to dialysis that includes this active medical management that you're discussing. Um, and I really appreciate how much you emphasize understanding the patient's medical complexity and what's going on with them medically, but putting that right alongside with their values, their joys, their hopes, so that together they can make an informed decision with their providers, with their families, and really chart their own course. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think the last thing I, I can show to help illustrate the way I think through this with people together with people is that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, um, the data for people over 75 is that dialysis may or may not help you live a lot longer. Under mm -hmm. 75, dialysis almost always helps you live longer. Um, mm -hmm. This is one study out of the United Kingdom where a group of people either chose dialysis or chose conservative care. And I believe this group was 70 or older. So it was a mix of people. And mm -hmm. you can see that the survival in the dialysis group was nearly three times as long as the survival in the non-dialysis or conservative care group. So mm -hmm. for many people, dialysis does entail living longer. Mm -hmm. um, but what you have to know is that when you look at what that added time looks like, it's often full of dialysis care 
recovering from dialysis and then sometimes going into the hospital from complications, either from the dialysis or from the mm -hmm. access that you need in order to do dialysis and procedures for those. So this is the kind of uh, schematic I show to patients and families and say, this doesn't tell me what the right decision is for you. Mm -hmm. This this is a start of a conversation where if you tell me that living as long as possible, you, you know, is a top priority for you, we'll probably work out a way where I'm going to recommend dialysis as the best option to serve those goals. Mm -hmm. You're a person who has a view of your life as nearing its completion, where you don't want to be highly medicalized in the last months of your life, meaning spending a lot of time going to and from appointments or in and out of the mm -hmm. hospital. I might start talking a little bit more with you about conservative care and how to sort of optimize and maximize your enjoyment of time uh, at home. Yeah, and I think this slide really captures that importance of understanding an individual's value and understanding where the individual has priorities. Right. Um, because I think all of us have our own perspective on values and, and our priorities. And it really should be the patient's well-informed decision that guides the care. Um, and so while dialysis may extend the quantity of life, what does that mean in terms of quality for the individual? That's right. And, and I also, just to clarify what I said earlier, age is just a number, meaning you can be a very fit 85-year-old and dialysis might be the most appropriate and fitting option for you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I think this is another way to say that age is just one factor and illnesses and, and medical information is another factor, but your own outlook and how you want to spend your time and what you call good quality time, that is a is a factor I think needs to be more prominent than it is now in decision making. Yes, well said. <laughs> so lastly, just returning, you know, the fact that I really don't think that the Grim Reaper um, is the alternative to dialysis. I think for the most commonly that that kidney failure develops is in people over 75 and these are the real care options transplantation unfortunately at that age is very rarely available um, so you're really comparing dialysis and conservative kidney management i'd say that in many people the survival is comparable um, in one in dialysis you're going to experience more procedures than without it uh, the symptom burden, which we can talk more about, is pretty high in both cases. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, thinking about hospitalizations and and eventually where you spend the the end of your life, dialysis mm -hmm. does tend to put people on a more medicalized track, and more mm -hmm. people die in the hospital or ICU mm -hmm. than people who choose conservative management can mm -hmm. exert some preference or control over mm -hmm. where they're going to be in their last days and mm -hmm. hours. Yeah, and I think that that piece of place, that, that aspect of place, really is something that we don't talk enough about. And something that for our audience, I hope that they're hearing today, is really advocating for what place means to you. Um, because it sounds like with that conservative active medical management, you're less likely to be in the hospital. As you said, you're less likely in that medicalized tract versus in the dialysis arm, you're more likely to be in a medical institution of some kind throughout your journey. Um, and so I think that when patients are thinking about how to approach their care, it's not just this, this option or this option, it's the where and how is my time spent and what does it mean getting to and from these different options. Um, so I think that having that really comprehensive, like that forum that you described from um, the Australian consent forum, that was such a well presented consent um, that we don't really in our system currently, in, in my opinion, and please correct me if I'm wrong, don't really offer our patients that level of, of comprehensive understanding of this big decision about to pursue or not pursue dialysis. I absolutely agree. Um, I think, you know, I, I draw a lot of parallels with oncology and, and patients who live with cancer because I think mm -hmm. advanced kidney disease is every bit as serious and hard to live with as cancer. Um, and I sort of think of the question of dialysis when someone is approaching that where they're already quite ill or quite mm -hmm. older side, it should be like a really in-depth conversation about whether a fourth line of chemotherapy is going to help. Um, right. So I think that kind of a detailed conversation about the trade-offs and the burdens and benefits is absolutely mm -hmm. necessary. Yeah, and I think it doesn't happen often enough. And so again, kind of really trying to encourage our audience today to feel really empowered 
to go back to their physicians and have those conversations to say, how, how is this, uh, this um, intervention, how is dialysis, if that's what they're being offered, how is this going to impact my everyday life? How is this gonna impact my longevity? Um, and really encouraging everybody on the call to really feel as though their voice really is the center of this whole decision-making process. Definitely. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned benefits and burdens. Can you actually walk us through a little bit about what those, what, what some burdens are, what maybe complications or symptoms that someone facing dialysis may, may consider? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, First of all, just the, the symptoms that advanced kidney disease cause, whether you do mm -hmm. dialysis or not, tend to include fatigue, lower appetite, um, itching of the skin, sometimes nausea, uh, sometimes restless legs and poor sleep, mm -hmm. and sometimes low mood and um, anxiety. So I think you you know, at starting from a baseline of those symptoms, the burdens of, of sort of each therapy option um, alter some of those symptoms and some it, they don't. So some of the burdens of dialysis that I hear over and over from my patients are just the amount of time it takes every out of your life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the most common dialysis type in the U.S. is called in-center, which means that the patient goes three times a week for usually four hours per session um, to a center where nurses take care of the dialysis for them and then they go home. I mean, can you imagine taking a four hour plane trip uh, three times a week? It, it's just a lot of time and it's a lot of time yes. to pass. Yes. Um, another burden is that transportation to and from dialysis tends to be really unreliable and really stressful. Um, uh, as well as after dialysis, some people feel washed out. I say some because some feel better and some feel a little energized, but a lot of my older patients really feel, they almost call it like a dialysis hangover where they get home, mm -hmm. they stay in bed the rest of the day, and then they're not feeling better until the next morning. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the burdens of dialysis are like the logistics for sure. And then in terms of how it, it, it taxes the body is, you, you know, you have to think a little bit like the kidneys. When your kidneys are working, they get 24 hours a day to slowly, gradually clear out the stuff that you you need to get out of your body. Mm -hmm. But if the kidneys aren't doing that and you just get 12 hours a week, it's a much more aggressive and sort of intensive change that, you know, mm -hmm. taking three liters or six pounds of water out of your body within a four hour period it's like going mm -hmm. to a hot yoga class or, or running mm -hmm. a marathon. Like it, it really can leave you feeling depleted because you are, and it can lead to muscle cramps and blood pressure changes. All of those I would really consider to be the highest burdens that I've, I've heard through my patients. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad you said the emphasize the fatigue. So I think that's what I hear the most from patients is the fatigue related to even just getting there. And the experience of it and then feeling so kind of drained generally because there are those that do have a little bit of a, a boost yeah. um but i think i hear mostly from folks just they want to be able to go and engage with their families and do the fun things when they're done with their dialysis session but their body just isn't isn't there yeah. it just doesn't have the energy to do it exactly and i yeah. should say you just reminded me to mention that yeah you know, there is a big initiative in the u.s to grow and offer more home dialysis options. Mm -hmm. And most patients find that their control over their time and life and their quality of life is better with home options. It's mm -hmm. also more, um, more physiologic, meaning that it's, um, it's, it's not trying to accomplish so much in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but those therapies medicalize part of your home and they can be intensive to learn. And so, you know, it's still no walk in the park, I'd say. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. be a better option for some people, but it's um, still plenty, plenty challenging. Challenging, yeah. I think for a lot of folks that don't necessarily have the comfort with um, with medically managing, you know, the, the machine itself, um, it can kind of feel overwhelming when yeah. they're already feeling tired and kind of worn out. Um, yeah. But I do think for some people, it can be a reasonable option. Yeah. Um, um, you had mentioned kind of comparing chronic kidney disease to folks with cancer. 
Could you help us kind of in the decision-making process go a little bit into how we look at dialysis compared to other life extending treatments like chemotherapy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dialysis doesn't cure kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And um, I think of dialysis as like, if you broke your leg and needed crutches to get around it, the dialysis is the crutches. Uh, it's not going to actually change that your leg is broken. It's just going to get you where you need to go in the meantime. Um, mm -hmm. And I think some form, I mean, oncology is an incredible field. There are plenty of cures around these days and it, it's amazing to watch, but a yeah. lot of chemotherapy is also about trying to make quality of life as good as possible. And mm -hmm. at a certain point in someone's life, we all know that chemotherapy is toxic, like it causes side effects. And at a certain point, those side effects can be way more burdensome than the benefit of the chemo that's not really working to control the cancer anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think dialysis is the same, that it may be true for some people that up to a certain point, dialysis is quite useful and sort of gets, keeps them going, keeps their illness in check. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, patients with advanced kidney disease experience a lot of other health issues like mm -hmm. heart attacks and strokes and other vascular issues, blood flow issues. And I think when those start to build up, the added benefit of dialysis can be less and less. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I think everyone is sort of, well, maybe in my world and your world, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Wilhoy, like the palliative care and hospice have come to be seen, come to be understood as part of really good cancer care because nobody should be put through toxic treatments with no benefit. You should mm -hmm. be allowed to be comfortable and be in control of what you can be in control of. And I just, yes. I think that that's true also for kidney disease and, and palliative care and hospice should be offered as robustly as they are for patients with advanced cancer. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent argument. And I, and I hope that, um, that as our field of palliative medicine continues to grow, that we can have a broader reach um, into kidney cl clinics or dialysis clinics so that patients always have that, that parallel support uh, while they're receiving the care, whether it's the conservative medical management or actively receiving dialysis, should know that the palliative care team can be there to support with symptoms and the patient's understanding of their disease and complex decision making. Um, and we're not, we're not there yet, but certainly I hope that in our lifetimes as physicians that we can see that. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Something I always am curious about, and I always kind of try to talk with my nephrology or kidney colleagues with, um, is when do you start a conversation with patients about stopping dialysis? Would you have that conversation before they ever start, or do you tend to wait until someone's reached a certain phase in their dialysis where you say, "Hey, we should maybe stop this"? Or how does how do what does that look like to withdraw or stop dialysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I smile because I think philosophically, when to have that conversation is another um, uh, thing that varies a lot from person to person. And I think currently in medicine, the usual practice is to, for me as the doctor to say, well, I would wanna know, so I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> and that makes sense to me emotionally, like I'm a person who'd wanna plan. I've learned in taking care of people with my palliative care hat on to do a little more detective work about how helpful that would be for that person. Are you a person who likes to broadcast to the future? Do you find that helpful and mobilizing? Do you find that, that it gives you some sense of control? Or actually, does hearing about the what ifs of the future actually depress you or make you anxious or make you feel mm -hmm. out of control? So mm -hmm. I have to say, I wouldn't say across the board that stopping dialysis is something that every patient who starts dialysis should talk about upfront. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that kidney clinicians, and, and I'm talking about doctors, nurses, social workers, even nutritionists, should mm -hmm. get more comfortable asking, how much do you like to know about the future? Mm -hmm. or when you think about the future, what comes to mind? What hopes or worries do you have? Mm -hmm. Those two questions will give you so much information about what a patient or family wants to know and what will be helpful to know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, stopping dialysis is the number three cause of death among patients on dialysis mm -hmm. after infection and cardiovascular events. 
the truth is that people choose to stop dialysis usually when their their health is otherwise deteriorating. Mm -hmm. Very few people, although some, choose to stop dialysis because dialysis itself is just too much and they can't take it anymore. It's usually that that, that person has, God forbid, had a stroke and can't walk anymore. And so getting to and from dialysis and feeling really tired no longer sort of is worth, worth it for them. Or people with dementia, where after the dementia itself progresses and the person can no longer understand what's even happening at dialysis and maybe can't stay safe with the needle in their arm, that's another time where they're choosing to stop dialysis. But in my book, that's when an, an other serious illness is making dialysis not make sense anymore. Okay. And when someone has reached that point where dialysis doesn't make sense anymore, could you kind of walk us through what it looks like to die, the actual dying process of chronic kidney disease? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think when someone has been on dialysis for a while, it's the most common thing is that the kidneys stop producing any urine whatsoever. And this piece is important because if, if you're a person who makes no urine or just a few drops of urine every day, your prognosis or how long people usually live after stopping dialysis is around seven to 10 days. I've had patients who pass away a lot sooner and I've had patients who pass away a month later. So there's a range, okay? And the, you know, what happens, the most common thing that happens is that as days go by without dialysis, a person will feel more and more sleepy, more and more weak, and sometimes, depending on the other illnesses they may have, they may start to feel fluid build up in their body, which can. Um, during that period, medications to reduce the sensation of being short of breath or of being uncomfortable should be used. And, you know, usually that. And more hospice care would be appropriate. Um, I think the. You know, many people worry about pain at the end of their life. And um, if you had pain before you stopped dialysis, it's very likely that you'll have pain after you stop dialysis. However, stopping dialysis and passing away from kidney disease is not in and of itself a painful experience. Um, it can be emotionally painful, especially for family. Um, but for the person themselves, it tends to be a slow, gradual more like sleeping more, awake less, eating less, and then an eventual passing like that. It sounds like, I mean, honestly, it sounds like a more peaceful way to be able to transition and to die um, when you're not experiencing necessarily the acute pain, maybe, or a bad shortness of breath that you maybe experience with other illnesses, but all of the, the symptoms you're describing, like some fluid buildup and maybe some shortness of breath can all be managed. And I appreciate that you emphasize the importance of having a hospice team involved to be able to really support the patient with their symptom burden and support the family through the process as well. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, I've noticed that we have 36 questions <laughs> in, in, our, in our question bank. And I wanna just check in with our moderators um, to see if we should go yeah. ahead and move towards some questions. Thank you, uh, Susan. I, and you guys are doing a fabulous job. I think most of these questions are answered, but if, I, I might just throw out a couple and Mitz can back me up on this, but um, many, many uh, wonderful questions asking difficult topics. Two that I think Dr. Gelfin would, uh, I think, be uh, good at answering is uh, one, one was talking about the caregivers, the families, not only you know how much time it takes for not only the patient, but the families, but, and then also, uh, discussing this uh, difficult topic with the families and the patients. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's a lot of experience and data about how how hard it is for for family members and for caregivers for patients who are living with kidney failure. Um, you know, dialysis is a way of life. And it's usually a way of life, not just for the person, but for the whole family. Planning meals together or vacations or, or graduations, all of that kind of thing ends up being a little bit influenced by 
um, dialysis schedules and trying to optimize the moment of, of, you know, most alertness and, and feeling best, you know, to be able to participate. I think, um, caregivers and family members, uh, in my experience can often feel really high anxiety, but also like they don't have a voice or a way to engage deeply with the um, dialysis team. Part of that is the way dialysis is structured it, in that the units themselves are um, not always staffed by a physician every single treatment. And there's not a lot of privacy between chairs. So if you want to have a, organize a big conversation, it, it's not quite the same as the oncologist where you could go in with with the patient to a visit, it, it's a little bit more decentralized. And I think that can be incredibly hard um, and scary for family members. I also think there are times where caregivers and family members are the ones advocating to keep doing dialysis, whereas the person themselves is starting to say, I can't do this anymore, or I don't want to do this anymore. And those can be really hard because, well, it always comes from a place of love and of, of, advocacy usually and my god patients on dialysis are some of the toughest patients that out there meaning they've often been through so much that it can be really hard for families who've supported them for so much to get to a point and say what do you mean you're done what do you mean you don't want to do this anymore um so i i navigate those tensions a good amount um in my in my work and i don't have a simple solution or answer those are those are challenges yeah, thanks for that. I uh, I think Susan could weigh in on. Uh, there's several questions on you know medical management and one question about hospice and palliative care. Maybe uh, Susan, you can discuss the difference between the two, and then you know who manages that um, end of life uh, care where it's conservative, uh, palliative, etc. Um, that's a great question. And um, so broadly speaking, palliative care is meant to come alongside anyone that's facing a complex or advanced illness at any stage. So any stage or any age that a patient um, is experiencing some sort of life limiting illness. And palliative care is really meant to come alongside the patient while oftentimes they're receiving other life extending care. So like while someone is getting chemotherapy, while someone is receiving dialysis. And so it can be in parallel with someone's otherwise life extending course. Uh, the hope with palliative medicine is to reduce the symptom burden that a patient may face, but also really serve as um, an advocate for the patient in terms of communicating the complexity of the disease, making sure that the patient and the family really understands what is going on with the person medically, but then also being sure to elevate that person's voice, the individual's voice, so that the person's individual values, wishes, goals are still being optimized while they're receiving the life extending care. So we really try in palliative medicine to manage people's symptoms so that we are enhancing their quality of life, but also trying to really serve as advocates to make sure that their voices are heard throughout their disease pro process. Um, so palliative care is truly focusing on someone's comfort at any stage and any, any age, any stage and any age of someone's disease process. Hospice on the other hand is truly a philosophy of care where someone has arrived in their final phase of life, they no longer wish to pursue life extending care, and instead they want the care that they receive to focus purely on their comfort, and they want that care to come to them. So it used to be thought, and often still is thought, that hospice is a place where people go, and the reality is that hospice comes to the individual. Um, there are inpatient hospice facilities, and those are reserved for very specific, very complex symptom needs. But for the majority of patients who receive hospice care, they receive it in their home or in their living facility. So hospice care is not meant to be you know, alongside life extending care. It's truly meant to honor someone's final phase of life to be, off, to be able to offer robust symptom management so psych psychosocial support, spiritual support, um, so that when someone is facing their dying process, that they have a team there that can support them through the process and support their family through the process. In fact, when someone dies in hospice care, 
the family, the loved ones who are left behind are able to receive bereavement services for the 13 months after the person's death. And I emphasize that just to really reinforce the value that the hospice philosophy faith puts on the whole person, the whole family, knowing that when someone is dying, it's not just this one individual whose life is impacted, but really the whole families. And so palliative care and hospice are oftentimes used interchangeably. Um, I always try to encourage folks to, to understand that while they both focus on comfort and quality of life, um, when hospice is offered can be very different than when palliative care is offered. Um, and I hope that answers that question. <laughs> I will say just to piggyback uh, Susan, Please. and some, some of the comments seem to be about this is, um, you know, there are some structural policy barriers um, right now for patients with kidney disease to get good palliative care and hospice care. Most palliative care in the US has grown out of cancer centers and many, many places still only see patients with cancer. Um, I think more community-based palliative care services um, have been taking on patients with kidney disease and without cancer. Um, and the hospice itself, there have been some pilot programs of being able to do it at the same time as dialysis for a short period of time, which I actually think is really, it's the way that the rest of the world does it. Um, it shouldn't be so black and white that if you, if, if your goals are for comfort and yet you still want to do a little bit of dialysis, I strongly believe that you should be able to as a sort of slow transition toward the end of your life rather than this black and white, pretty terrifying leap into the like stopping dialysis uh, um, experience. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that's another concern that I have sometimes for the folks on the call, for the audience, that we talk about palliative care as like, as if it's just, oh, just call your palliative care team and they'll come to your home. And the reality is for many patients, for many individuals out there, it can still be very hard to access a palliative care support. Um, and so we do have a huge, I think, um, absence of really robust palliative care programs in the country so far. Um, I'm hoping that, that over time that will change. But what I would advocate for, if, even if in where you live in your local community, if you're not able to get a hold of a, an actual palliative care agency, I think that it's even more important for you to feel empowered to be this advocate for yourself and to be the voice that you need you need yourself to be. Um, and so taking kind of the spirit of this conversation and knowing that when you're facing something like chronic kidney disease and perhaps it's progressing to something like in stage renal failure, that you get to be in charge to say, to talk to your physicians, to ask specifically, what are the benefits? What are the burdens? How are you gonna support me through this? To make sure that even if it's not a palliative care specialist, that you're still getting the questions answered that you need to make a well-informed well decision about your care. Uh, yeah, the, the questions are are keep keep coming in quick, but I, I think some that I'm am, uh, looking at, uh, since many of the folks that are on the call are from across the United States, I'm not even sure if some else, there's a lot that has to do with your community mm -hmm. and not only what is available, but what's the uh, kind of expectation. I think some folks are uh, saying the docs are not willing to listen or wanting to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think those are the issues when people run into a burden where maybe they don't have access to some of these additional services. What 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 are their options? What what can they do? Yeah. Uh, first of all, yeah, just to validate all of you that um, I very much believe you and experienced as well the barriers to getting good palliative care for patients with kidney disease. I've also experienced and um, really struggled with the, um, the way that many patients feel forced to start dialysis or that they have no choice and that it's either do dialysis or I have nothing for you. Um, and I you know, what can I say? The, these issues can't be solved quickly. Um, I do believe that they start with better education for people who train in kidney disease, that from day one, they need to understand their patients as human beings with autonomy and with preferences. And I spend a lot of my time teaching communication skills so that the rising generation of nephrologists are more equipped to engage in conversation and actually listen 
to uh, a patient who may be saying they don't want something. Um, the data definitely shows that nephrologists often will sign off of a case or feel like they have nothing to offer if a patient doesn't want dialysis. And my time in Australia really proved to me that they, they do have so much to offer if only they knew and if they only were they this was modeled for them and trained. Um, so you know, I'm I'm not here to say that conservative management is super available in the US. It's not. That's part of why I, I'm so, you know, amped up about this work is that. <laughs> it's often the most patient-centered and by the way, least expensive care option. And it usually, it, it aligns with what people want for a certain portion of the population. There've been a ton of questions about what it is. So I thought I would just say a little bit more about that. Um, when I say conservative kidney management or active medical management without dialysis, what I essentially mean is the same kind of care that people are receiving for their earlier stages of chronic kidney disease aimed at preserving the kidney function that you still have. So going back to the stages we discussed, say you're in kidney chronic kidney disease stage four, say your GFR, your, your clearance percentage is around 18%. And that means that fluid builds up on your legs, um, skin is itchy at night, and your blood pressure is high, and your blood counts are low, or you have anemia. All four of those things are consequences of advanced kidney disease that can be managed with medications. So as your disease progresses, if you choose not to do dialysis, conservative management means using blood pressure medicines, water pills, uh, blood production boosting medicines to, to help your anemia, iron, as well as lotions and medications to reduce itching or to reduce nausea. Um, so chronic your conservative kidney management really involves ongoing medication, lifestyle, diet, and psychosocial support to help you through living with those symptoms um, if you're not going to start dialysis. What it's not is nothing, <laughs> meaning a lot of a lot of doctors will be like, well, you know, if it's not dialysis, what is it? We're just giving up, or it's it's not. You want to do nothing, and it's I, I stress so much to the my learners. It's it's the opposite of nothing. It's actually highly mm -hmm. time intensive, and part of what I think we need in this country to grow this option is actually um, the support. Meaning, mm -hmm. it takes a village. I I. I am lucky to have a social worker and a nurse practitioner as part of my team. Um, and conservative management takes a lot from each one of our skill sets, uh, chaplaincy as well. If if we could have that, I would immediately choose it and, and nutrition dietitian support as well. Um, so dialysis as an industry has built all of those, maybe not chaplaincy, but it's built social work and nutrition and all these different supports into it because kidney failure has a lot going on, whether you do dialysis or not. So I would like to see a parallel growth of those services for patients who don't want to do dialysis. Um, and I think, you know, it's not there yet. Dr. Gelfin, you talked about uh, dialysis uh, uh, four hours, three times a week and all that. Could you talk a little bit about home dialysis, perineal dialysis? Yeah, so, so the forms of home dialysis that exist are um, home hemodialysis, which means um, dialysis where blood comes out of your body and gets purified by the machine and then returned to your body, as well as peritoneal or abdominal dialysis. That's where um, you have a catheter like, like a big IV put into your belly and you uh, put fluid into your abdominal cavity, usually at night. The fluid itself sucks out the toxins that the kidneys usually do, and then you drain the fluid in the morning. Um, peritoneal dialysis is a, is a very useful therapy um, particularly for people who still want to work during the day and don't want their medical care interfering with that. Um, it involves learning how to do it yourself and learning how to stay, um, stay away from infection, which is a top concern for patients living on peritoneal dialysis. Once you get the hang of it, people will do it while they're asleep and then they wake up, they hook themselves up, they go to bed, they wake up and they unhook and they go about their day. 
Um, it is less efficient, so you do need to do it usually seven days a week or seven nights a week, um, but at least it doesn't take up your daytime. Some people can't do peritoneal dialysis just um, physically, logistically, people who've had a lot of other surgeries in their bellies, people who might be at higher risk of infection. Um, so it's not always an option for everyone. And you also need a quite a bit of space in your home to, to just have the supplies. You need to be able to lift 15 pound bags in order to load it. it it's not, um, it's not just medical uh, a decision making when it comes to peritoneal dialysis. It's also sort of logistically in your house. Is this going to work? Um, home hemodialysis is also growing. That's essentially where you learn how to stick the needles in yourself to what's called a fistula, which is a big vessel they make through a surgery on your arm. And then you do a few hours of home dialysis every day. Um, some people can get away with only five times a week, and it's not four hours. It's usually two or three hours. Um, and people sometimes will do it in the evening when they come home from work um, while they're watching TV, that kind of thing. Again, home dialysis and of all of all kinds is is it still a, a change in life and in in um, lifestyle? It, it's incredibly helpful to have a really, really engaged, family member or caregiver who's going to help you. And for a while, it was law that to do home dialysis, you needed to have a uh, family member present in case you had a really serious bleeding event at home, which could be super dangerous. Um, so anyway, I do think that there are, um, are ways to customize dialysis to you and your needs. Um, and there's still a group of people who are not going to be really well served by any form of dialysis. There was one question I just wanted to address because it comes up a lot that can you do dialysis and then do conservative care? And I just want to share that not really. Um, you can definitely try dialysis and stop if it's not working for you. But um, once you've started dialysis, the kidneys usually shut down completely and stop making all urine. Um, and that can be from dialysis itself. It can be from just the progression of the illness. Um, so the, progno you, the prognosis is not the same as the data that I showed. If you start dialysis and then stop, most people live a shorter period of time than months to years if, if you do it that way. Yeah, I, I got that same message. So people are kind of wondering, well, when, when do I make the decision to stop, to start? Can I do one and do the other? And it uh, sounds like you're, uh, which makes sense, obviously, if you... Uh, if you're needing dialysis and you don't do dialysis, that is going to move quickly or to move you quickly or to the uh, quicker to the point of needing um, more care, hospice care, et cetera. Um, any comment on just the U.S. dialysis system? There's been um, comments on how it runs and maybe is pushing our use for dialysis into the elderly population a little bit more than the other countries. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, of course, have a lot of opinions and experiences with this. Um, I don't have any relationship to any of the large dialysis organizations. Uh, I have to say, I just like to zoom out. If you look at the history of dialysis in the US, going back to the 1950s and 60s, when the technology itself first became successful, when dialysis first started, it was an extremely limited resource and it was only provided for people who um, were expected to live the most productive lives if they were kept alive. And I think the that passed when it was really provided mostly for um, younger, whiter, male, um, productive members of society was really, really um, prejudiced and re really... Uh, part of the advocacy through the 60s and 70s that led dialysis to be covered and sort of a default for anyone who develops kidney failure. Okay, so it went from being this pretty unfairly allocated, really, really limited resource to um, essentially we have Medicare for all in dialysis. Everyone who needs it can can get it. So the effect of that was well intent. You know, the doing that was well intentioned, but the effect I think was that it stopped being used 
in a thoughtful or sort of individualized way. It started to be seen just as the default of what you do when. Um, and because of that, there's been a little bit of tone deaf or blindness to the fact that the outcomes for patients after a certain age are really poor. And so why would we offer and promote something that is not going to be good for our patients? Um, do I think that the financial incentives of the large dialysis organizations in the U.S. have a role in that? A hundred percent. There is no denying it. Do I think it's the only thing? No. I think there's also plenty of sort of cultural expectations and um, approach to healthcare that make people think that that makes sense, that very few people question that, both clinicians and patients. Um, whereas I think in the other, in socialist countries where um, there's a lot more discussion up front of the value of healthcare, of the, the point of uh, what are the outcomes going to be if we do, you know, X intervention, um, I think that's in play as well. Uh, just to say, I 100% think that there's unfortunate financial pressures on the system. And I also think there's some cultural and maybe spiritual um, reasons that dialysis has been an attractive default for, for us in the U.S. Yeah, I think uh, the, the questions are still coming, but I think we're pretty much at the end. Uh, I will turn it over to Susan to... Um lead us out. Dr. Gelfin, uh, I hope uh, the folks on the, the uh, uh, webinar were just as impressed as I was. I think you did a great job, both you and Dr. Wilhoyd, on, on kind of compacting this very difficult topic. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> and yeah, Dr. Gelfin, I wanted to echo uh, Dr. Carroll's sentiment. Thank you so much. Your, your unique blend of your expertise with kidney medicine and nephrology alongside hospice and palliative medicine is so unique. Uh, and it's such a gift that you're able to offer your patients. Um, I have no doubt. And honestly, I feel it was a gift for us today. So thank you for offering your wisdom and you're clearly so compassionate um, and passionate about this topic. And I'm hopeful that um, as you are training new younger physicians, uh, we can really start to grow this idea of active medical management so that folks know that we do have options when it comes to their kidney health at the end of life. Um, I also wanna thank Compassion and Choices for supporting today's webinar. This series as the end nears is a part of a broader series that we're trying to do to educate patients and individuals and really empower our audience to really feel as though they have the information they need to make really well-informed decisions and chart their own course. For those of you listening today, please reach out at our website. We have multiple resources and tools that you can access as you start to consider what your, what your journey will be. I'm excited. We do have more um, of these seminar, these talks, these webinars coming up. So our next one is about metastatic cancer. So advanced cancer, that's gonna be on Tuesday, May 30th. And we do look forward to hoping, hoping that everyone that's here today can join us for that talk. Um, and in June, we'll be talking about progressive neurologic disorders like ALS and dementia. Um, but really today, I wanna go back and just say thank you again, Dr. Gelfin, for supporting Compassion Choices, for your wisdom, for your knowledge and sharing it with us today. Yeah. And again, you guys can all access, we are, we are videotaping this, so you will be able to access our archived editions of these webinars of the series as the end nears. Um, and our hope is simply to help each of you on this call today feel more equipped to make the decisions that are appropriate for you so that your voice is heard throughout your process. Please follow us on social media. You can see all the options here for compassion and choices. And thanks again to everyone who's supporting us. We could not do it without your amazing resources and your financial support. So thank you all very much for being here and for being so involved in this work. <laughs>